When the master was calling the roll at the primary school in college lands, you were meant to call back Ancho and raise your hand as your name occurred. Ancho, meaning here, here and now, all present and correct, was the first word of Irish I spoke. The last name on the ledger belonged to Joseph Mary Plunkett Ward and was followed as often as not by silence, knowing looks, a nod and a wink. The master's droll, and where's our little ward of court? I remember the first time he came back. The master had sent him out along the hedges to weigh up for himself and cut a stick with which he would be beaten. After a while, nothing was spoken. He would arrive as a matter of course with an ash plant, a sally rod, or finally the hazel one. He had whittled down to a whiplash, its twist of red and yellow lacquers sandered and polished and all together so delicately wrought that he engraved his initials in it. I last met Joseph Mary Plunkett Ward in a pub just over the Irish border. He was living in the open in a secret camp on the other side of the mountain. He was fighting for Ireland, making things happen. And he told me, Joe Ward, of how he had risen through the ranks to quartermaster, commandant. Now, every morning at parade, his volunteers would call back, Anshao, and raise their hands as their name occurred. And shall. A poem by Paul Modun from his selected poems. So, welcome to Philly Loves Poetry, a collaborative adventure by the Moonstone Arts Center of Philadelphia and Philly Camp. The focus of our program is to give our viewers the experience of the rich culture of poetry in the city of Philadelphia and the surrounding area. So tonight we have a very, very, very special guest, Paul Modun. Uh, Paul is an Irish poet. He has published more than 30 collections and won a Pulitzer Prize for Poetry and a T.S. Eliot Prize. At Princeton University, Paul is currently both the Howard G.B. Clark 21 University Professors in the Humanities and founding chair of the Lewis Center for the Arts. Paul held the post of Oxford Professor of Poetry from 1999 to 2004. And he has also served as president of the Poetry Society UK and poetry editor of The New Yorker. Paul has been a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Paul was given an American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature in 1996. Other recent awards are the 1994 T.S. Eliot Prize, the 1997 Irish Times Poetry Prize, the 2003 Pulitzer Prize, the 2003 Griffin International Prize for Excellence in Poetry. So welcome, Paul. It's really wonderful to have you. Uh, and so, um, the, yes, there are 31 um, books of poems that you have written, but tonight we're, we're going to focus on your most recent book called How to Scalp. And of course, that is not an expression that uh, uh, we necessarily in this country would know. Could you explain the origin of that expression, How to Scalp? Well, I can try. And first of all, I want to say what a delight it is to be with you. And uh, I'm talking to you tonight from just up the road from uh, Philly, um, Princeton, um, a town halfway between New York, where I spend a lot of my time, like precisely halfway between New York and Philadelphia. That's why it was built where it was built. So I feel very attached to Philadelphia. And uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, I'd be happy to try and say a little 
a word or two about this concept of the Howdy Skelp. As you say, it's it's not a term that's much used anywhere. I first came across it uh, in a poem by uh, Ravi, Ravi Burns, as they call him, and um, who, of course, wrote in that uh, particular dialect. Um, I am from Northern Ireland, where there is a very strong Scottish component in um, in our speech, right? There's a strong Gaelic component. We just heard that word, Anshaw. And uh, there's a strong, uh, and of course, there's a, a connection between Scots Gaelic and Irish Gaelic. They are all, but the, you know, pretty much the same language. Uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, their large tracts of, of the two languages would be understood by uh, by speakers of both. So um, the the version of English, though Scots Scots. Uh, uh, that uh, is spoken in the lowlands and lallands uh, of Scotland um, was is also has some currency in Northern Ireland, as you probably know. Uh, there was one point in history when um, the uh, south west section of what is now Scotland and the north east section of what is now Northern Ireland uh, actually uh, were contained in one kingdom, and. Uh, the word Scottish, Scotus, in fact, means Irish. So very strong connections. Um, so anyway, uh, when I was a kid, if one misbehaved, uh, for example, uh, that poem describes being sent out to cut a stick, uh, uh, to to <laughs> to beat one's own back, as it were, and to give one a scalp, a scalp. Uh, my father would say, "I'll give you if you don't behave yourself. I'll give you a scalp round the ear." Skelp is a slap. Now, howdy uh, is the uh, term for a midwife. So a howdy skelp in this particular phrase refers to the slap that a midwife would have given a newborn child. I don't know about on the face, maybe on the bottom, um, uh, to, to, kind of, to, to, to get it uh, springing into action and ready for it ready for life. So um, that's what it refers to. And, uh, you know, it's, it is, it's a, it's a phrase that uh, will, as I say, will not be familiar to most people. And there's a strong argument for that reason for not using it as the title of a book, because people, you know, will, will look at, many people will look at it and say, what on earth does, does that mean? I have no idea, goodbye. Um, so, but there's also an argument for using it in the sense that uh, people may, may also say, huh, that, I wonder what that is. That, that sounds interesting. I might even be lured into <laughs> the, 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 the book by uh, just uh, the slightly strange aspect of the title. So um, it's a book that was written, in a, like all of my books, actually, in a somewhat unexpected way. It was written predominantly during the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, when I when I was uh, spent most of my time up in the village of Sharon Springs, up uh, about an hour west of Albany. And uh, so written mostly there over a period of a couple of years. And uh, as I say, unexpected. I know idea that I was even writing a book and then one day it occurred to me that actually it might make a book. So um, maybe um, should I read a poem or two from it? Uh, one question I wanted to ask you Paul sure. you know about this because it's uh, uh, it's a very remarkable and very different book of poems. I call it an experience really of poetry but and sometimes when I, I, pick, I read a book of poems, there's some uh, line or there's some stanza or there's one poem that becomes, for me, the centerpiece that helps. Uh, I call it the tour guide for the, rest of the, for the rest of the book. And on page 17, which is in the first really section of poetry about American standard, mm -hmm. on page 17, um, you write, I take a frontiersman as my alter ego. 
in the shortly to be released prequel to the Red Dead Redemption, he wasn't so much of an Ulster Scots background as Huguenot Davy Crockett. Um, but it's the frontiersman when I was uh, when I got that expression, and I said, "Well, this is what this book is about." When you know, when you think of the frontiersman, you think of uh, that they're really charting unknown territory, and there's you know there's no borders or boundaries yet for the frontiersmen because they're making new territory. So um, that really became. And, and it really helped, you know, propel me uh, through these poems. So I just wanted to throw that out there to you and to respond to that. Well, uh, first of all, I'm glad that you liked the book. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you might think, uh, as I certainly do, that um, if poetry to, is to be interesting at all, even in, in the most modest way, it has to be operating at some kind of edge. Um, so that's really one of my articles of faith. <laughs> I'm, I'm not interested in poems that, uh, and, and I don't know if anyone really else much is interested in them either. Poems that you sort of, yeah, well, I, I would kind of have, ex I would have half expected that. Um, the poetry that I'm interested in reading and writing, and of course, for the most part, <clears throat> Uh, uh, you know, one writes poems for oneself because the poems that one wants to read are not necessarily readily available. That's not to say that one's not uh, reading, uh, you know, the great poets of, of history. I certainly am, and uh, trying to uh, learn from them. But at some level, you know, if you... <laughs> If you were getting everything you needed from that diet, um, uh, you you wouldn't be writing poems at all, right? So that's a, that's a very very banal idea and maybe a, a very basic idea, but certainly one that I um, hold by. So so being on the edge, being on some kind of a frontier, <clears throat> um, is metaphorically or literally. Um, is uh, is very important to me. Now, the, the, the person who's mentioned there, of course, in the context of North America, you know, we need to be very mindful of uh, how one person's frontiersman, um, you know, is uh, actually uh, bringing uh, death and destruction uh, to another person. I mean, um, I, I myself am, am very uh, conscious of um, the inappropriateness of the notion that one hears often in this country that it's a new country and it was it was developed only quite recently um, by by brave explorers um, and you know while I understand that I don't quite buy into it and I, I'm, I'm always concerned about the um, offence, frankly, that that gives to the native peoples of this mm -hmm. country. So, um, you know, I mentioned Davy Crockett there. Um, I mean, and, and I refer to a really quite wonderful um, video game called Red Dead Redemption. And uh, so that's that's what's going on there. It doesn't necessarily mean that I uh, believe in mm -hmm. the, all the exploits of the frontiers men and women, uh, fascinated though I may be by them. And in fact, again, coming from Northern Ireland, um, many of these frontiers uh, men, um, actually uh, their families did time, as it were, in Northern Ireland. Many of them came from Scotland, um, spent a hundred years roughly in Northern Ireland. And then for many of them actually found it, found it a bit rough, even in the... Uh, 17th and into the 18th century and moved on uh, to the US. And indeed, um, uh, uh, what would one say, uh, used to horrific effect sometimes some of the techniques that they had developed in extirpating the locals in Ireland uh, on, 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 their, on their new locals, the Native Americans. But anyway, let's, we don't have to belabor that point. 
but that's what that refers to mm -hmm. in some sense but yes um i am interested only in write, trying to write poems that you know as a reader you come out the other end and you think to yourself wow what happened to me in there what was that what, what was that what was that experience that's the idea mm -hmm. You, and I, I read an interview uh, it was done by the, the, it's called the White Review. Mm -hmm. And there was a question that was put to you by the interviewer. It says, are you inclined to resist full ownership of a poem? And you said, yes. Honestly, I don't think my, of myself as the writer of the poems. I think about myself as having very little to do with the poems or the songs. Obviously, they reflect something uh, of me. And then the um, interviewer says, well, who, who's writing them then? And you said, well, with any luck, they are writing themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, 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 once again, I, I, I put that out there in, in terms of understanding uh, this approach uh, to, to writing your poems. Well, I know, I know that for many people it, it seems a little bit fanciful. I, I know mm -hmm. that. And, uh, but, you know, if, if one thinks about it for a minute, I mean, I, I often, when I'm asked about this um, idea, I often think of the extent to which, you know, when, it's, when we're as students, uh, teenagers, whatever we are, high school students or university students, college students, we're writing an essay um, or we're writing or even writing a letter if insofar as we do that or writing an email okay um, at some level one may have a plan for it but what I'm very interested in is that experience that most of us I think have had of um, say reading a paper an essay that one wrote 20 years ago about um, Moby Dick or um, Elizabeth Bishop or whatever it was, and you think, wow, huh, who wrote that? It could not possibly have been me. I mean, I'm not smart enough to have written that. The insights there are, um, are not insights of which I would be capable somehow. It seems very strange that I would, my name would be even remote attached to it, and so that and uh, and uh, <clears throat> you know, I, so I'm interested in the idea of, um, I suppose, some version of inspiration, however corny it may seem, but most I think many people have had this experience of being taken over, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, by a force beyond oneself, and. And it's for that reason that um, I, I do not claim ever to have written my poems. I, I, I claim my experience, the best, the, the best way I have of describing the experience I have is of being uh, open to whatever it is the poem might want to do in the world. Um, I don't have an agenda for it. My job, I believe, is to find out what its agenda, if it has one, uh, indeed, um, and I believe it does actually, at, at best, at the best, uh, what that agenda might, what it wants to do, what it wants to be, right? So um, I try to be available to the poem. And I, you know, I know from talking to people in other lines of business, painters, um, sing songwriters, but they have this experience too. Um, and it, as I say, I know that for some people it seems a little bit odd because there are people, there are indeed people who think they're in charge of their poems. Hmm. And I, in my experience, um, um, actually they, off, they often are. They're absolutely in charge and often for that very reason their poems aren't particularly interesting mm. right because 
I am of no interest, and what I have to say is of no interest, actually, at all. But I work on the principle that the poem might have something interesting to say. And that's that's, And I'm trying to allow it. You know, it's not that I bring nothing to the table. Of course I do bring something. I bring, you know, 50, let's say, years of sort of sitting at a table. And, and what that might mean. I don't know, I'm not sure if it means all that much, but let's say it means something. I bring that to the table, knowing what a table is, and also uh, having a sense that maybe if I sit there <laughs> and open myself, uh, something interesting might happen. That's all, that's really all I do, yeah. you know? You, mm -hmm. so you said in the same interview, so once again, very interesting approach about and you something that you indicated that you expressed to your students is not necessarily knowing writing poems of what you know about but writing about the unknown and a certain ignorance that one it's good to have as you approach a poem uh, not about what you necessarily know all about but maybe what you don't know very much about. Yes, I think that's the key, actually, <clears throat> is accepting ignorance. Um, you know, in this culture, North American culture, let's call it US culture, um, for some reason, we've got it into our heads. I mean, it's generally considered to be a sine qua non, not that one would necessarily use that term, all that much, but that it's it's a it's a given, uh, it's a prerequisite that you know what you're doing, right? You, everybody, you know what you're doing, and there are certainly instances when when that would be preferable. I mean, if I'm going to have open heart surgery, for example, or indeed if I'm going to get my hair cut, which I might one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like that. The uh, you know, I do expect the the heart surgeon to know what she's doing, right? And um, what they're doing. Um, I don't actually care so much about whether or not the barber knows what she's doing or what they're doing, because actually it's not going to be the end of the world if they don't. Mm -hmm. And at some level, it's not going to be the end of the world in the poetry business either, of course. But... Um, so again, I work on the principle, if I know what I'm doing, you will probably know what I'm doing. And there's actually, there's no point. There's no point in even, in you're even reading my poem that I know so much about. Because it's probably, um, it's just probably not very interesting or it's something you've seen before. So I mean, crudely put, again, we want to be in a place where we've not seen this exactly before. We may have seen something like it, but we've not quite seen this. Uh, as I say, it's it's pretty basic stuff, um, but it, I, we have to remind ourselves of it all the time. I sometimes of these these most basic ideas um, are overlooked. Well, um, I think what we would really like to hear most definitely is you to read your poems from How These Skill. And um, you could, of course, discuss them. But I just think there's such a range here in these poems uh, of styles, of subject matter, which is really extraordinary. Um, in, so, yeah, thank you so much for saying that. I mean, yeah. It, yeah. it, it really, it's very, that means a lot to me that you say that, whether or not, I mean, yeah, it's very nice of you to say that. Um, you know, one, one of the things, one of the things one is trying to do is, uh, is, it, is it, it, there's something, yeah, one of the things one's trying to do, I, I think, is uh, is to do something again to do something different from poem to poem. Um, so I mean, 
I try not to do the same thing twice. That doesn't mean I don't end up doing it, of course, because you know we're 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 kind of we're limited enough little creatures. I think when you get right down to it, and we probably only have two or three ideas ever in our in our lives, and even if we try to um, remake ourselves and in Yeats's roughly a rough version of Yeats's term even if we try to do that even if we're conscious of it you know it's all, we're almost inevitably uh, doomed to repeat ourselves and maybe that's okay I mean, maybe that's actually one of the things that <clears throat> uh, allows us to recognize continuities in an author uh, I mean someone other than oneself right one's not sitting around looking looking for continuities in oneself um, but um, so it's almost inevitable. So let me read a little poem. Um, you know, I just this is one that, <clears throat> you know, of course, right now, I don't suppose any of us can be thinking about anything much except the state of the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the what's happening in Ukraine. And um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a dreadful, uh, moment and uh, a trap, you know, a, a moment the likes of which um, I I haven't seen. Um, some people who are older may have seen something like it. Um, I was born 1951, so I do remember as a kid the remnants of um, um, of, uh, of you know of, of shortage of food rationing after World War II, it was still very hard to get a banana, for example, in the early 1950s, or an, an orange in some cases, just the remnants of it. And then, of course, the Cold War, um, and so on and so forth. But, uh, I mean, this, this, is a, this is a big moment uh, for us, I think, as a, in, our, in human history. Um, Anyway, this uh, is a poem that uh, takes some of the imagery associated with war, and particularly the repurposing of, um, in the Second World War in particular, and I think in the First World War in Europe, the repurposing of, of certain materials in the you know, street furniture, um, for example, iron railings, cast iron railings, and uh, in one case, uh, the image that got me started for this poem actually had to do with the repurposing, to use that word again, of um, hardwoods, walnut, maybe, um, for example, chestnut, that were used in uh, banisters and ridge posts um, to, to make um, rifle butts right so that's where i could start it on this the banisters are ornamental gates and railings that were melted down for rifle barrels have gained some sort of posthumous renown by unambiguously drawing a line in the sand the gates and railings are finally taking a firm stand and even more emphatically bringing things to a close. The exit wound is their approximation of a rose or a geranium under gauze on the windowsill. Gangrene, the green and gold of the first full-blown daffodil. Also rendered so it would even more tellingly rend, was lead stripped from the gutters and flashing. For lead will bend along a spine as it did along a walnut ridge post. What was once an outer sanctum is now the innermost. Shouldered as rifle stalks after a mere three weeks of drill the banisters are gradually taking another hill 
little um, imagistic poem there using some of that uh, um, sad um, uh, imagery. <clears throat> so um, I'll read maybe a, a poem that just for a little change of uh, change of uh, tune, unless you wanted to ask me a question, perhaps. I just love it to listen to these poems. <laughs> Okay, so this uh, slightly different um, feel to this one. It's a poem set in a probably a warmish clime, um, somewhere in Europe, maybe France, maybe Spain, maybe Italy, in a little village square. Um, and the, the, the central image of it has to do with that custom, or at least what was a custom uh, of the uh, projecting a film on a sheet uh, in an open air um, context. And um, so and it just it plays with that idea and, and runs with it. And um, it's slightly naughty, but this is a mature audience, I'm sure, right? At 701. The sheet. We were sitting in a village square not so very much broader than the bridal suite that overlooked it. The suite where we'd spent at least part of that afternoon extending our modest repertoire of love forays and love feats. Now we made do with playing footsie at a cafe table while pondering fettuccine with sage, plein air or en plein air. You check your iPhone, a culinary herb native to Southern Europe and the Mediterranean, once thought to grow best in households where the wife is dominant. Even though the supporting evidence was far from scant, this was a theory I must put to rest, given the frantic smoothing out of air by the man and two young boys hoisting a sheet through what was irreparably twilight. A grandfather and you surmised his two grandsons were about to run a test on the projector that had only recently become a prominent feature of our lives. It looked very much as if the eggplant was introduced to the West by Alexander the Great. As to whether normal wear and tear could have accounted for the rip in your Himalayan uh, wrap itself, a shade of aubergine and a blend of wool and moire, the jury was still out. Acquainted though we'd been with the fact cellulose nitrate is notoriously unstable, we were nonetheless taken unawares when the reel of film began to disintegrate even as images of what looked like some of our earlier exploits were thrown up on the screen. So um, a little uh, poem from uh, a sequence of uh, pieces set in uh, upper uh, the Mohawk Valley, up, 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 uh, upper uh, New York State, um, which I mentioned earlier on. It's just a very um, impressionistic, journalistic sequence of poems about the earliest uh, days, the first, the first days of, of the COVID, as we became conscious of the COVID pandemic. And uh, it's a sequence of sonnets, in fact, uh, for what it's worth, which is generally not necessarily worth all that much. But in this case, it's a corona of sonnets. And, and you know, at the risk of that sounding a bit um, facile, um, I embarked on this um, project, a corona, as you know, of sonnets, um, uh, you know, as a sequence of pieces where the first line of one is um, reflects the last line of the previous one and so on and so forth and the 
uh, if there are 15 of them, uh, sometimes they're, if it's a, it's, it's a, 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 a corona, that heroic corona, as it's sometimes known, um, the 15th is made up the, of the first slash last lines of uh, the previous 14. So slightly mad cap um, business. But in any case, uh, and actually in a strange way, uh, running uh, contrary to what I, in some sense, to what I was saying earlier on about not quite knowing what I'm doing because um, there's some little, some little knowledge involved there. Uh, though the capacity for um, for not knowing what one's doing is continues to be endless even then. So I will just give you a little taste of it. At the end of our driveway, the yellow recycling bin will, will be picked up this morning by Vlad, our superintendent of public works. I certainly don't want to impugn the motives of the village elders who, after the big flood, washed it out, closed our road to through traffic. That's proved to be largely a godsend. It's now only once or twice a day, an Orphic figure passes, glancing back for whatever has his scent and will, somewhat soonish, tear him limb from limb. Where it opened, the picture house in Cobbleskill would be showing a shoot 'em up or creature feature. For three weeks now, Jean and I have been on the lamb in Sharon Springs, a couple of old school bank robbers lying low for the foreseeable future. It's not so long ago the future held out the promise of travel to another antique land unknown as yet to Fromer or Fodor. I spent yesterday ignorant of the fact the valiant Adam Schlesinger has gone the way of all dust. Together with Chris Collingwood, Adam made Fountains of Wayne, a band whose songs combined the height of literary taste with low blow hooks. I Fen, a doctor from Wuhan, who blew the whistle on the Chinese Politburo seems to have been disappeared by those sons of bitches. No motion hath she now. As for our homegrown kingpin, he's warning us against narcos on burrows. The Pentagon has ordered a hundred thousand human remains pouches. Once we subscribed to the idea of boxes made of pine. And it continues in that vein uh, for 14 or 15 sections. A um, little change of uh, pace, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> I'll, um, <clears throat> excuse me, read a little um, poem. Uh, the poem in which, uh, in fact, the title, uh, the phrase that makes up the title appears, and it's a very um, troubling poem in many ways. And as I was suggesting earlier on, I'm actually a believer in all poetry, been extremely troubling, and um, or troubling to a greater or lesser extent. Um, if only to be equal to the, the world um, in which we find ourselves, which is uh, <laughs> troubling to an e perhaps an even greater degree. Salonika, that young woman's body sprawled by the side of the road looked as if it had been thrown clear like a burden her car desperately needed to offload. The car itself was pretty much a write-off a cairn of chrome and windshield glass dating back to the Romans, or at least the Romanovs. As she flew through the air, her dress must have ridden halfway up her back, leaving her buttocks bare. Another driver had come to a stop and was already on the phone with the emergency services or the cops. 
I very much doubt we'd been of the slightest help had we pulled over on our way to the airport to give her what? A hidey scalp? In the days when we still welcomed someone into the world, we wouldn't have thought it strange that a collet be lightly knurled. In the archaeological museum, there's at least one artifact for which the use is no longer known. We approach it, therefore, with a modicum of tact. That young woman's body sprawled by the side of the road represented yet another episode around which we would do our best to steer. Another driver had come to a stop and was picking his way over the pre-dawn blacktop to where she lay, three quarters prone. I very much doubt would have been of the slightest help if the ambulance we'd meet could barely manage a yelp. Anything we might have done would have been a falling short as she flew through the air after her car had hit a pole she may have felt a pang of despair to think her grasp on things had now gone slack. The car itself was pretty much a write-off, be it a circlet for a quaff or a hoop through which a soul might pass in the days when we still welcomed someone into the world, or a ferrule from a javelin hurled beyond our range. In the archaeological museum, there's at least one artifact from a past we simply cannot reenact. It may be ivory, it may be deer bow. That young woman's body sprawled by the side of the road looked as if it had been thrown clear. As she flew through the air, her skirt had ridden halfway up her back. The car itself was pretty much a write-off, a kern of chrome and windshield glass. Another driver had come to a stop and was already on the phone. So I very much doubt we'd have been of the slightest help had we pulled over on our way to the airport. In the days when we still welcomed someone into the world, we wouldn't have thought it strange. In the archaeological museum, there's at least one artifact for which the use is no longer known. That's a poem, I suppose, that uh, reflects, um, you know, um, something of what I was describing earlier on as our predicament just now of, you know, of knowing what, what to do, how to respond, if at all, to um, an emergency, you know. And uh, so it's a, it's a strange poem, it's a poem that uh, uses a, a particular device that's based on a series of trial A's or trial A's, depending on where you come from, or indeed if you ever use the word at all, which is a verse form, that uh, traditional verse form that uses a very particular sequence of repetition. So um, it has a something of an incantatory and component, I suppose, that poem, and a, and, a, and a troubling, in a strange way, the repetition, so they don't ever quite mean the same thing but, uh, from line to line when we hear them again. It has a, it has a, a disconcerting effect, as I hope, that, you know, readers or listeners, viewers would might think appropriate to, to the circumstances. Um. In other of your poems and throughout the book, there is a really a bewildering cast of people that whose names we know from David Bowie to I don't know if the Till of the Hunt is in there, but I mean there's just and I'm I was wondering why because I said to myself actually you could probably have fit all these people in the um, in the art museum or the uh, uh, at a music hall. I mean, it was there were so many, and but they served a purpose. And so I, I'm really trying to get at well, why why so many, and, and what were they used for? 
Well, certainly, I mean, there are, there, it has quite a large cast of, of characters. Um, <clears throat> what the poem, a particular poem, I think, in which you, you may be uh, focusing is called American Standard. American Standard, as you know, was the name of a, a bathroom fixture, mm -hmm. toilet uh, fixture company, American Standard. And uh, there is a, there is a, um, um, uh, there is a, um, th th there's one, one section of the poem does feature a product made by American Standard. Um, but it's a poem that um, is modeled roughly on the uh, wasteland. And uh, it, it's a, and of course, the wasteland, as you know, there's a lot of talk about the wasteland these days. I seem to be talking about it every other day of the week because, of course, it's the centenary of the publication of that poem. And um, as you know, one of the interesting facts about the wasteland is that that was not its uh, original title. It was called He Do the Police in Different Voices and it was that's a quote from uh, a character in uh, our mutual i think it's our mutual friend uh, by dickens pretty sure it is um who is uh, says of a, says of her uh, ward or her son adopted son um i think it is uh, that he's particularly skilled at reading newspapers and when it comes to the crime blotter the police blotter he does the police in different voices so he dramatizes these characters um, and that was Eliot's title and it's, a, it's a, a useful title because it reminds us of the extent to which the wasteland is actually a drama as much uh, if not as as much as a poem uh, the same being true of the of that other great text uh, whose uh, centenary we celebrate this year the way um the ulysses by james joyce and uh, on which of course eliot uh, drew really for his um method in writing the wasteland so um so that's one of the reasons in this particular scene there's a huge cast list as you say mm -hmm. and um, part of what the poem the the characters in the poem are, are have been persuaded to go down to the city of San Antonio, or San Antone as they call it, to spring a, 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 an immigrant, a, a, a refugee from south of the border who has been held in a detention center there. Um, you know, this seems like, you know, um, ancient, history now old news compared to our new new news but it's still of course a feature of, of life in this country in any case so um the um the um they're they set off for this um by plane um, um for san, san antonio and they're setting uh, setting out to with a huge cast of characters, as you say, to uh, to free this young person who's been held in the detention center. Excuse me, one second. <clears throat> Pardon me. So anyway, when it comes to a finale, it's hard to beat the combined forces of Buddy Bold and Captain Beefheart, the recently cashiered Captain Crunch. Uh, Charlemagne and his 12 paladins, William Tell, William Holden and the Wild Bunch, Cyrano de Bergerac, Anthony Burgess, Frank Zappa, Frank Vedekind, Jorge Luis Borges, the Borges, the Man in Black, the Thin White Duke, My Last Duchess, Preston Sturges, Buffalo Bill, P.T. Barnum, Jenny Lynn, Benny and the Jets, Bernardo Bertolucci, Bernard of Clairvaux and the Valet d'Absin, Pocahontas, John Smith, Joseph Smith, the prophet Elijah, Amelia Earhart, Emily Dickinson, Emil Zola, Emiliana uh, Zapata, Emilio Pucci, the Duke of Aquitaine, a.k.a. John of Gaunt, 
Sister Sarah, who long ago gave up the cloister for life with two mules, Maria Tallchief, the tailor of Gloucester, Ralph Vaughan Williams, our friend Ralph Waldo Emerson, Ralph Royster Doyster, Nancy Cunard, the New York School, an ever more erratic Uncle Jim, Davy Crockett and his faux coonskin hat, Jimi Hendrix, Jiminy Cricket, April Bloomfield, Anthony Bourdain, Kermit the Frog, Toad the Wet Sprocket, Jelly Roll Morton, Jumping Jehoshaphat, Calamity Jane, Annie Oakley, Alicia Keys, the Keystone Cops, St. Vincent, St. Cecilia, Cecilia Fire Thunder, and an elite war band of Oglala. The Carmichaels, Hoagie, and Stokely, not to mention a special ops division comprising El Chapo, Robin Hood, Harry Houdini, and Thoreau. As we're pushing away from the gate, the man in black is heard to remark to Sister Sarah, uh, and a man of constant sorrow, that a red and white striped sock will surely help our archers compensate for wind speed and direction. The teenage mutant ninja turtles needn't mind losing their reputation for being tight-lipped, nor need we mind the serial ordeal of being watched by 40 cellular phones as we hurtle along the dimly lit south to Laredo, worried mostly our steed might be tripped by a hole engineered by such pocket gophers as have gone over to the other side. Pardon, senor, but what the worker found in the packet at sunup and escort was an Irish salter wrapped in the screenplay for Bottle Rocket. Virgilio still has my back. That's where I got the idea I should slide down a sheet when making my escape. McMorris and his petard oysters are augmented now by Kurt Vile, Kurt Vonnegut, Buckethead, the Shredder, the Shredder Banksy, Castor and Pollux, Lady Astor, Lady Hamilton, Nelson Rockefeller, a half dozen West Coast oysters, the Seventh Cavalry, Slattery's Mounted Foot, Omar the Tent Maker, Amerigo Vespucci, Nico, Nicholas Rowe, the man who fell to earth, Geronimo, Hieronymus Bosch, Mad Max, Muddy Waters doing the Hoochie Coochie with Lewis and Clark and their three old pierogue, Guy of Gisborne, Guy Burgess, Aretha Franklin, Edward Longshanks, Patti Smith, the San Patricios, a snatch squad of brigantes and their distinctive britches, Frank Zappa himself, desperate for the slightest purchase on the steep bank of breaking news. Conan O'Brien, co-hosting our brutal assault with Conan the Barbarian, even as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is assuring us our hope we might gain access to the detention center by way of bridge constructor portal on PlayStation 4 isn't entirely futile, assuring us it's not entirely for nothing we toil. We're, we're getting close to time, Paul, but there's one poem in there that I, oh, so many poems, but it's titled Ruin. Oh, yeah. And uh, I wonder if you talk about that and read that poem uh, for us. I'd be very happy to. And uh, <clears throat> I'm, it, it's a poem that, well, <laughs> says what it means in a strange way there's not much to say about it and uh, you know often we have a feeling that poems don't quite say what they mean that they're always saying something else that they that they really mean but can't quite bring themselves to say so this is a poem about a building uh, that i've passed for many for well actually i say here 60 years ago i first passed it and it's on the M1 motorway outside Belfast, heading west uh, towards Dungannon, near which I lived for many years. And it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a ruin, but an extremely well-preserved ruin, if you know what I mean. And uh, so I've tried to describe it here, and uh, I will have a go at it. A ruin. It might have been a grist mill, a, dilapid, a dilapidated granary or grange. I first drove by some 60 years ago 
and with my little eye espied through a door frame the tousled ferns and red-haired dockens of kids my own age sent out to play in the snow. Their snowballs so specific in the sprawl. Windowless now, roofless, tucked under the first sheltering hill of a range that ran all the way to Mexico, a country into which we still hope to ride hell for leather, still hope to adjourn after the stick up. This ruin betokens not only the slow mow mowing of a meadow for a shopping mall, but the fate that would befall the many tagged and retagged over those 60 years. The landscape is so marked by change, the bungled peace process, the shoddy bungalows, the wind farms taking us in their stride, so marked by all the turns things have indeed taken for kids now summoned back from playing in the snow. The nettles almost as tall as its dividing wall, a ruin seems the only thing intact. Thank you so much uh, for this treat uh, to be our special guest here on Philly Loves Poetry. It, of course, this is the book, Holly Skelp. It's uh, it's really a wonderful book. And I, I, I've read and reread it, and I think it's that kind of wonderful book of poetry that really entices you to do that. Thank you so much. I thank you very much, and um, I hope to sometime have you back again uh, on this on this program. Um, in signing off, of course, uh, I represent the Moonstone Art Center. Actually, I'm the board chairman of Moonstone Incorporated, and um, you know we do a hundred events in a year, poetry readings, and that includes close to three hundred poets. And so I say that, that we continue to need your support uh, to be able to continue to do this. Uh, Larry Robin has done much of this on his own, but we need your support. So you can go to our website. Uh, you can see a way you can provide support. And um, I'm really appealing you to do that. Uh, and once again, I thank you all for tuning in tonight. Uh, I think it was an extraordinary opportunity and experience uh, to listen to this very great poet, Paul Muldoon.